and welcome to the 2021 virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival. My name is Mike Sesma. I'm a member of the Gaithersburg City Council, and I'm your host for this presentation today. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting these authors by purchasing their books from our wonderful bookseller partner, Politics and Prose, the greatest independent bookstore in the region. Uh, you'll find purchase links in the presentation description. Given all that we've been through over the past year, it's really important to support local and independent bookstores like Politics and Prose. So I also want to extend a big thank you to our 2021 featured sponsor, the David and Michael Blair Family Foundation for their generous support and all of the other sponsors who've uh, uh, lent their support to the Gaithersburg Book Festival. I hope you enjoy the presentation. This is gonna be a great discussion of medical history. Welcome to the medical history panel of the Gaithersburg Book Festival. My name is Tyler Simmett. I'm an internist and disaster medicine specialist in Baltimore, Maryland, and chief of clinical education for the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. I have the honor to introduce to you authors of two exciting stories covering medical history and the stories they tell in their books about the structure of society in the mid 1800s and early 1900s and the effect it had on women wanting to work in healthcare and um, how society responded to leprosy individually and policy wise. Authors are connected to their stories in many different ways and hearing from the authors can clarify the importance of the story to the writer and the points they wanna make. Sometimes you need more than science to understand what's going on, you need the story. So these are deeply researched, rich stories that come to life in the books and hopefully in the discussion as well. One of the writers is a reporter, the other is a writer. I'm here as the medical person, but the stories are gonna go way beyond the medicine. So I'm gonna start by introducing Pam Fessler and her book, Harville's Cure, and then Janice Nomura after that. Most of you may have seen Pam Fessler on All Things Considered or heard her. She's a correspondent for NPR's National Desk where she covers poverty, philanthropy, and voting issues. In her reporting at NPR, Pam does stories on homelessness, hunger, affordable housing, and income inequality. She reports on what nonprofit groups are doing, how the government is responding, and what others are doing to reduce poverty, and how those efforts are working. Her poverty, report, her poverty reporting was recognized with a 2011 first place national headliner award. Pam also covers elections and votings, including efforts to make voting more accessible, accurate, and secure. She's done countless stories on everything from the debate over state voter ID laws to Russian hacking attempts and long lines at the polls. After the September 11th ter terrorist attacks, Ms. Fessler became NPR's first Homeland Security correspondent. For seven years, she reported on efforts to tighten security at ports, airports, and borders, and the debate over the impact of privacy and civil rights. She also reported on the government's response to Hurricane Katrina, the 9-11 Commission report, Social Security, and the Census. Fessler was one of NPR's White House reporters during the Clinton and Bush administrations. Before becoming a correspondent, Pam Fessler was the acting senior editor on the Washington desk and NPR's chief election editor. She coordinated all network coverage of the presidential, congressional, and state elections in 1996 and 1998. In more than 25 years at NPR, Pam Fessler has been the Deputy Washington Desk Editor and Midwest, Midwest National Desk Editor. Earlier in her career, she was a senior writer at Congressional Quarterly Magazine, where she worked for 13 years as a reporter and as an editor. Um, she also took a year off from reporting to write this book, and I was going to give her an opportunity to talk about Carville's Cure. Thanks a lot, Tyler. I really appreciate it. Um, as you can see, I've, I've reported about everything except science and medicine. So a lot of people say, well, why did you write a book about leprosy and how the United States dealt with this disease um, throughout most, most of the 20th century? And like all good stories, it began with a family secret. Um, my father-in-law, when he was 78 years old, called us up one day and he said, I have something to tell you. I've, I've been keeping something a secret for more than 60 years. When I was a teenage boy, I went to school one day, I came home and my father was gone and the public health service had come and taken his father away. And they had taken him away because he had been diagnosed with leprosy. 
And he was brought somewhere to a hospital down south. My father-in-law didn't know where. And he um, never saw or spoke to his father again. But he kept it a secret for more than 60 years because his mother told him, don't ever tell anybody that your father had leprosy because the stigma is so great, it could destroy the family. But he just felt as an elderly man that, that he, he couldn't hold this inside any longer and wanted to find out what happened to his father. And that's when we began to research and discovered that there was this institution in Carville, Louisiana, that the federal government had run where patients in the United States who were diagnosed with leprosy were brought for, for decades. Often it was against their will. They were confined there, many of them until they died for decades. And it was all done, not out of medical necessity, but because of ignorance, because of fear, and because of the stigma of this disease. Um, so we went down, we visited Carville, and that's when I realized there was an extraordinary story that, that not only was my father-in-law's family torn apart by this disease, but there were hundreds, if not thousands, of American families that were ripped apart. And the patients were brought there uh, it was an old um, plantation um, on a, a very remote area of, um, of Louisiana and um, near Baton Rouge. And um, we went down and visited and, that, and, and when the patients got, went there, they not only lost their freedom, but they also lost a lot of their rights. They lost um, the right to vote. They were, if women had children who were born at Carville, their, um, their uh, children were taken away from them. The babies were taken away from them and put up for adoption unless they could find a family member. And this is, again, was run by the US federal government. And then the most amazing thing that I discovered down there, which is part of the book, was that um, this is one of the least contagious diseases there is. 95% of the human race could not contract leprosy. And the other 5% who can, it takes long-term sustained contact. So, but this was one of those myths that people just didn't, you know, that that was part of the common belief. Even today, people think it's highly contagious, but people didn't know it at the turn of the century. And it, and, and it started out, and I'm gonna show you for a, a picture here. It started out as a state institution in Louisiana and when the first patients were brought there, this was um, in 1894. And this, it was, as you can see, an abandoned plantation. But to me, this is a great sign of just how much these patients were basically reviled and discarded by society. Now, eventually, obviously, it got built up and it got fixed up, um, but it was a long, long struggle. And it wasn't until 1921 that the US federal government took over when there was a big demand to create a national adversarium. Um, but for me, the best, you know, so, so it, it turned out that it, it became this incredible place um, where patients were brought from all around the country but they started to create a community for themselves there because in many ways, while this was a prison, it was also a haven because it protected them from the outside world, which was quite cruel to people who were diagnosed with this disease. And here they found you know, common ground and camaraderie, people who didn't, you know, were repulsed by the thought of people with leprosy. And they created, you know, they had relationships, people fell in love, some of them escaped, got married you know, um, and came back. Um, there was an incredible cross-section of Americans. There were rich people, there were poor people. This disease did not uh, discriminate. There were uh, black patients, there were white patients, Hispanic patients, highly educated patients, um, uh, illiterate patients. Uh, they created school, they had a school there. They, they had sporting teams, they had movies and activities. It was a whole world unto itself. They even had Mardi Gras parades because that was the big thing. And I just wanna share one more photo here with you. This is a picture in the um, 1940s. And I love this photo because it just shows what an eclectic 
community it became and, and, and normal in many ways. I mean, these are men who were at there. There was a little uh, canteen there and they're all sharing, you know, a great time. It was a holiday party, but as you can see, there are black patients, there are white patients, um, there are, are Asian patients. Um, it was an extraordinary community. And then what started to happen, and this is my favorite part of the book, these patients started to fight for themselves because they realized the injustice of what was the way they were being treated. And they launched what is probably the first patient advocacy movement that I could find uh, in this country. And they fought to regain their rights, to regain their freedom and to regain the respect um, uh, of society and the public and also to fight for an actual cure for this disease, which in fact, was uh, found at Carville. And it's, an ex it's just an extraordinary story that I was very, very happy to, to, to write because I saw it as not only a picture of a, a really tragic slice of American history and how terribly we use disease against people um, to demonize them and to mistreat them, but it's also a great story of human resilience and hope and people fighting back for justice. That's great, thank you. Um, we'll come back to the story in a little bit. I wanted to introduce Janice Nomura. Janice is a full-time writer and she wrote the book, The Doctors Blackwell. Um, she received a public scholar award from the National Endowment for the Humanities in support of her work writing this book. Her previous book, Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey from East to West and Back was a New York Times notable book in 2015. Her essays and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, the Smithsonian, and many other publications. Janice Moore, did you wanna present your, your book? Definitely, thanks so much. So if you're familiar at all with the name Blackwell, um, it's usually in the context of one of the sisters, Elizabeth Blackwell, and usually followed in your mind by the phrase first woman doctor. She was the first woman in this country to receive a medical degree in 1849. There she is on the left. Um, her sister Emily, five years younger, received her medical degree in 1854. Um, together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children. Uh, and then subsequently it's Women's Medical College. So I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time six years ago. Um, this despite the fact that I am born and raised and still here in New York City, um, had grown up at a proudly feminist all girls school from the age of five, was the math science kid at that school, uh, graduated with the intention of pursuing medicine, though I later swerved. Um, I, how had I never heard of these women? It, it seemed impossible to me. So I went looking for them and I discovered that the black balls are not hard to find um, on the children's biography shelf. There are many versions of their story there and they have a lot in common with each other. Um, they all feature uh, a young, attractive, well-dressed woman with a stethoscope bending solicitously over a grateful patient. This is a chapter book version from the 1940s. Um, they always and only feature Elizabeth, um, rarely mention Emily much, if at all. Uh, this is the middle grade version from my daughter's school library, uh, a modern version, again, with nice clothes and a stethoscope, grateful patient. Um, here is the children's picture book version, a slightly younger, perkier version of Elizabeth with hair bows. But there's the stethoscope in the doctor bag waiting for her to grow up. Um, the thing is that Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell looked like this. Uh, and in the 1840s and 50s, when they were as young as the women in those picture book illustrations, even stethoscopes would have looked like this. Um, so it was very clear very quickly that those children's picture books were sanitized, they were simplified, um, they had merit, but it was limited. Um, and as I pursued the Blackwell sisters into the archives and started to listen to their voices in their own letters and journals, it became really clear that it was a much more complicated story than what fits in a children's book. So what is that story? Um, the Blackwell sisters were two of nine siblings, um, eight of whom were born in Bristol, England. They came to this country as children in 1832. Um, 
They spent a little bit of time in New York and then ended up all the way in the wild west of Cincinnati. Um, Elizabeth was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, um, blessed with a healthy sense of self-worth, and she chose medicine not because she loved science or necessarily wanted to heal the sick. Um, she she thought sickness was a sign of weakness. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. Um, she chose medicine because it was an unusually clear way to make a point. Um, she had become an admirer of the transcendentalist editor and writer Margaret Fuller, who had published a best-selling book in the 1840s when Elizabeth was coming of age called Woman in the 19th Century. And in that book, Margaret Fuller had argued that humanity was not going to reach a new level of enlightenment until women proved that they could do anything men could do. Um, Elizabeth, again, healthy ego, uh, began to see herself as someone whose life could perhaps prove this point, who, who could be a beacon to other women. And she chose medicine um, because at this moment in the mid 19th century, uh, medicine was in a state of flux. It was changing professionally and scientifically, and it was increasingly a profession of men who were credentialed by virtue of having earned a degree from a medical school. Um, Elizabeth recognized in, that in the 1840s, medical school was not the challenge it is today. Um, and that if she could find her way into one, attend all the lectures and pass all the examinations, it would be hard to argue that she wasn't as qualified as any man to be a doctor. So she made that choice to pursue that path. She wrestled her medical degree from the male establishment in 1849. Um, Emily followed her, both sisters uh, went to Europe to pursue further practical training because medical school didn't give you much of that. Um, in, in London and in Paris and in Edinburgh, uh, they became quite proficient uh, in, the, in the field, although it didn't protect them from this kind of snark in the press. This is a caricature from uh, an 1856 issue of the London satiric newspaper Punch meant to show Emily, who was then uh, working in Edinburgh, um, wearing the scandalous bloomer costume of a woman's rights activist, um, which she was definitively not, interestingly, um, wearing that costume with a ridiculous hat and a rather mannish profile, um, squinting through spectacles at the only patient who would consult a lady doctor, a lap dog, um, being clutched in the arms of a much more conventionally feminine and beautiful young maiden. Um, the accompanying article said something like, women doctors were fine because they would be able to take better care of their husbands and children, and they hoped that Dr. Blackwell would soon settle down and have both of those things. Um, luckily, Emily and Elizabeth were good at ignoring this kind of ridiculousness. Um, after their training, they converged in New York City and founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in a building which still stands in Greenwich Village on the left as it was and on the right as it is. Um, this was the first hospital staffed entirely by women. Um, its intention being not just for to be a place where poor women uh, could consult doctors of their own sex, but also to be a place where the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates could um, find a place to get the practical training that medical school lacked. Um, after the Civil War, the sisters uh, expanded their infirmary to include a women's medical college that had a degree of rigor and focus on practical instruction that was far beyond the uh, co-educational institutions they themselves had attended. Actually, they weren't co-educational, they were men's institutions. Um, so that was just the arc of their professional lives. Personally, uh, their lives were just as interesting. Both sisters adopted daughters. Um, Emily spent the last several decades of her life with a female partner and fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier. Uh, two of their brothers married two of the most prominent uh, feminists of the day, Lucy Stone, the women's suffrage advocate, and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in this country to receive, to uh, be ordained as a, as a minister. Um, to complicate the story further, the Blackwell sisters did not feel a high degree of sisterhood with their sisters-in-law. Uh, they diverged from the women's rights movement in significant ways, complicated ways. Uh, they also didn't always agree with each other. Um, they had differing, sorry, um, ideas of what um, a woman's role as a doctor should be. Elizabeth 
um, for various reasons, diverged more toward public health and policy, the idea of a woman as a teacher armed with science, and did a lot more writing and speaking than practice in her later career. Emily um, stayed in New York and ran very competently the institutions they had founded. Her idea of what a woman doctor should be was as competent a surgeon and practitioner and medical professor as any man. Um, so this is a good moment for this story, I think, um, not just because all we do is talk about public health, but also because we are you know, celebrating women at new levels of leadership in this country. And the Blackwell story is an interesting one because the Blackwells were not perky or pretty like those heroines of the children's books. Um, they were complicated and imperfect. Uh, prickly, very real heroines who change the world and whose story doesn't fit comfortably in a picture book or on a plaque. Uh, I think it's a great moment for complicated female heroines. So Janice, the Blackwell sisters were interesting outliers, what we call in medicine an N of one. They're interesting cases. How useful are outliers like the Blackwell sisters in understanding what was going on in the world? Um, well, I think you need an outlier to make change. Um, you, need, you need someone to be an extremist for a moment in order to move what everyone's idea of normal is. Um, I think this idea of, of women pushing against the edges of a woman's sphere was very much in the, in the, in the national consciousness in America in the 1840s. Um, you know, the, the, the summer between Elizabeth's two terms of med school was the summer of 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention and the Declaration of Sentiments, the birth of the women's movement. Um, so he, she was an outlier. She also was part of something larger, even though she didn't always join it herself. Interestingly. Interesting. And Pam, with leprosy, that's a disease that's an outlier because we still don't understand it. We don't know how to react to it. Um, how instructive is that to how we look at public health and other diseases? Well, I think that, um, you know, especially right now with COVID, dealing with COVID, you know, there were, there were so many things um, that have happened over the past year that made me think back to this story of what, how we um, dealt with uh, leprosy, which um, the modern name is uh, Hansen's disease. One of the things the patients wanted to do was to try and eliminate the use of that name just because it carried so much weight with it. Um, they wanted it named, in fact, after the, the doctor who had discovered the uh, bacterium. Um, but one of the things I, I, I feel is that, um, you know, politics really shouldn't have a role in public health policy as much as possible, because back in the turn of the century, the politicians were responding to a public hysteria at the time, a fear of germs, a fear of um, immigrants bringing in diseases, uh, these prejudices that people had and, and, and um, uh, incorrect beliefs about the disease, even though at the time, there were many doctors who said, you know, this disease is not that contagious. There are a lot more dangerous diseases out there. We should not be confining people. And so we, we have, but people ignored it. You know, the politicians ignored it and they were responding. We've got to get these people isolated and as far away as possible. You know, and we obviously have seen that, you know, in, in more modern times in our response to diseases, uh, the way we responded to AIDS initially. Um, and the, the depiction of that, you know, that's a disease that, you know, the people who, who got it, the first impression was, oh, you know, they deserve it because they were somehow a reflection of their morality, you know, that they were, uh, their behavior, they were performing, you know, they were uh, homosexuals or drug users, you know, it wasn't until uh, Ryan White, a young uh, boy who got it from a transfusion, got it that if people started saying, oh, well, maybe I could get it too, you know. Um, so, so we've seen that repeatedly. Um, and and it, it just makes me think we have to think again more seriously or about what are the repercussions of public health policy and what are, are we doing stuff that's responding to the science, responding to what we actually know about a disease and not these emotions and prejudices and, and uh, misbeliefs. So why do you think leprosy got pushed to the corner as an outlier disease when it's an infectious disease that's just not as contagious? Is it the biblical history or is it? Yeah, I think it was a combination of things. It was it was definitely the, not only the biblical history, but the you know through the through the um, 
through the centuries, you know, through through medieval times and the way we responded to leprosy. And it wasn't just, you know, um, you know, people who read the Bible um, who, who, who felt like this was a very dangerous disease. The way it was depicted in the Bible and in other um, literature over the years, you know, first of all, it was incorrect. Um, we now believe that the, the, what was de described as the leprosy in the Bible was not leprosy at all, but it was that your fingers fell off, that you know, your skin fell off, um, that it was again, a reflection of sin or something terrible that you had done. Also, I mean, advanced cases of the disease can be quite um, physically repulsive. You know, that people will get these lesions on their faces and, you know, be covered with lesions. They, they, um, their fingers, a, a lot of people will injure their um, limbs because what happens is they lose sensation in their, um, in their fingers and their feet and they injure themselves and they don't realize they've injured themselves so they can lose, um, limbs or fingers. Um, so I think it was a combination of the real, true, physical um, um, way the disease looks, as well as all of this literature over the centuries. And I just think that, quite frankly, society wants to have somebody to, you know, look down upon, you know, as the others, you know, that this is, they are the cause of our problems. And leprosy was a kind of a convenient uh, vehicle for that. Interesting. Um, and, and Janice, was picking the Black Girl Sisters framing the issue of women in medicine or was it more historical? Because the, the research really gave us the period and what life was like. And uh, you really mixed the story and the history well. And I'm wondering what was predominant? What was the, the key point you want to get across? I write, I, I try to write history so that um, the reader feels transported. I, that's the kind of history I like to read where I can imagine how it would feel to be in the room. Um, so to me, those two things are, are, are inextricably entwined. Um, the, the story of the people is also the story of not just how they felt, but what they felt, what they smelled and saw and handled, and used, um, the, the, the views they looked out on, the way the light came through their windows. So, you know, I, I, um, in my research, I, I work just as much with archival documents as I do with, um, you know, just following them around, trying to go to the places they, they stand in the places where they stood um, and feel what they felt. Um, so it was the, the history of the medicine was fascinating to me, um, but it was also inextricably entwined with their own um, response to this field and learning not just what worked and what didn't, but how do you do it? Uh, you know, okay, now I know that you're supposed to bleed somebody if they have an inflammation. What do you use? How, how does it work? H have I done it before? Do you know? Am I going to look stupid the first time I try? All of those things um, sort of humanize the the story and also feel very modern in many ways. I mean, there's plenty of young doctors I've talked to who confessed to have feeling to feeling exactly that way. Um, maybe they weren't working with leeches, but they were, you know, working with unfamiliar instruments. So all of that stuff is, is mixed up together. Um, I'm just, I'm just listening to, to, to Pam talk a little bit about, about the, about morality and public health. It, it, there's such an echo here with the Blackwell story as well, because of what was shifting in the 19th century, you know, the advent of germ theory was the advent of this idea that infection was amoral. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell came to medicine at a moment slightly before that. And so she was um, very much bound up with the idea that um, good behavior was conducive to good health. Um, and her idea of public health and was very connected to public morality, which you know is interesting. Um, she was a forerunner, but she was, she had, she, 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 she came to the field before this information. Um, and then when this information was available to her, when germ theory became accepted, it was hard for her to let go of the idea that an infection wasn't connected to good behavior. Um, so there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complicated of themes running through both of these stories. Right. There were a lot of things that made me cringe as a doctor and just <laughs> were hard to accept. And one of the worst was Pam's description of scraping the eye for leprosy 
and not getting permission because she didn't object completely. Exactly. And then saying, well, let's name the disease after him because he discovered it. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was the doctor, Dr. Ger Gerhard Hansen in Norway, who um, is the, the person who discovered it, but he, he couldn't quite prove that leprosy was contracted from one in, or, or transmitted from one individual to another. But um, in the process, he decided to try and remove some of the, or to, to insert the um, tissue from one leprous patient into another to see if she would develop that um, uh, disease or that form of the disease. But he didn't tell her he was gonna do this. They held this woman down, this patient. And later on, he was brought to the uh, trial. They, they brought a case against him, but the judges kind of said, you know, you know, the ends justify the means, you know, this is a really serious disease. And, um, you know, she shouldn't have been so hysterical about this, <laughs> which really, crack, you know, um, it, it, it was quite extraordinary. But when you talk about, you know, you as a doctor cringed, another thing that I cringed as a journalist, when I went back and was looking at the records in the newspaper depictions of leprosy in New Orleans, in the late 1800s, which in fact, some of those stories is what led to this public hysteria, it made me cringe. You know, it just, it, you know, they it was over the top coverage of just how terrible this disease was and how people were spreading it. You know, that there was somebody who was selling uh, meat and somebody from the, uh, the, the pest house had gone and was touching the meat. Now we were all gonna get sick. Um, it, it was, kind of cringy. Yeah, and a lot of errors in the coverage as well, just to make the story seem. And really one question I had is, were there competing narratives at the time? Were people saying, this is wrong? Or, I mean, yeah. both of you got to the level of conversations that was amazing, yeah. that you could recreate them from so long ago. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, there definitely was at the time in the late 1800s, as I said, there were doctors. There were, in fact, I would say most doctors were saying, you know, this is not that bad a disease. We have we should be worrying about TB. We should be worrying about smallpox, yellow fever, which we were worrying about, but you know, not to the same extent where we were basically imprisoning people. Um, but you know, the they were just ignored. There was actually an editorial in the Times Picayune, late eighteen hundreds, saying that this disagreement among doctors was really distasteful, and that the state legislature should just pass a law saying the disease is contagious. And that would settle things. <laughs> Forget what the doctors have to say. <laughs> Forget the science. Right. Let's come up with a decision and move it Sounds forward. Sounds familiar. <laughs> so this is a book festival and we've got a lot of readers. I'm wondering when you wrote the book, did you have a specific audience in mind or was it getting the whole story? Janice? I like to say that I write for, I write history for people who don't think they like to read history because that's often a good description of myself. Um, my audience is, is um, people who wanna be transported to another place in time, um, but who like to know that what they're reading is real. Um, uh, you know, I, my, my greatest moments are when someone um, is reading what I'm writing and forgets that it's history. That, and, and, and just responds to it as pure story. Um, I like to think of that as, as sort of getting your, getting your nutritious food, but at a, at a gourmet feast rather than as a, as a heap of vitamins. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm writing for, for everyone, um, people, and, and, and mostly I think for people who don't automatically think of themselves as part of the target audience. Um, I would love to reach people with this story who aren't necessarily big women's history buffs or medical history people, um, but who just like a good story and are surprised to find themselves, find themselves absorbed by this. And you also bring out emotions with your history, because I know I was, I was frustrated reading some of it going, why don't, I mean, why are they starting their own women's medical school? Why aren't they opening up the men's medical school? Why do they need to go overseas? And why are they going to Scott? So you bring out a lot of emotions that I wasn't sure if that was just me or if that, if that was a goal. Oh, I definitely, it's a goal. I, I, I don't think you can respond at a deep level to a story unless your emotions are involved. I'm glad that yours were. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I would just add that I, I, you know, with with my years at NPR, I mean, that's the way we tell stories. We tell stories through people and try to get at issues through how it's affecting people. And I came to this book with, as I say, no knowledge of science, no knowledge of medicine. I barely knew the difference between a bacteria and bacterium and a uh, a virus. Um, and you know, I wanted to t- solely tell it through the eyes of the patients and some of the, um, the uh, nurses and doctors who work there, and then use that as a, as a platform to kind of get at some of these issues. But to me, it was really a very personal story. And partly because I came to it through, um, you know, this, uh, my, my father-in-law's experience and the impact, I could see the impact it had on his life, that this had quite frankly, actually destroyed his life in many ways and, and turned him into a very reticent human being. And one of the things I discovered when I was working on this book was how many other people um, and families had very, very similar experiences. That it, it was very, very tragic. What it did not only to the patients, but their extended families. Is there a hope that the book moves change in some way? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have 200 new cases a year diagnosed in the United States, which is obviously not very many, but 200,000 new cases around the world every year are diagnosed every year. So there are millions of people walking around who have had leprosy. Many of them have been cured because it's very, it's actually easily curable. But in many parts of the world today, people are still treated terribly when they're diagnosed with their disease, they are abandoned by their families, they are isolated. Um, And the result is many people who suspect they might have leprosy don't seek treatment from a doctor because they are so worried, not only about the stigma, but how much alienation they'll have to go through. Um, Even though, you know, when you, the medicine that we have today for it, within 48 hours, you are no longer contagious. And within a year, you can be completely cured. Um, and, and the medicine actually is readily available, but people are still suffering from this. So, so I do hope that my, my, my book will have some impact on people who have this disease today, and then also how we respond to other illness, uh, uh, diseases. It also struck me that both books are truly American stories. It's the first doc- female doctors in America. It's a uniquely American re- reaction to leprosy, but both connect internationally in different ways from the diagnosis and looking at how others treat it. Um, Is there a reason that we, our stories are resonating internationally or is it just the same issues are are international? Gosh, um, I think that that there's a commonality to these stories. Uh, you know, um, what was happening in the minds of the Blackwell sisters in pursuing medicine was starting to happen in the minds of, of women in Europe and, and Britain as well. I, they got there first. I think America was a, 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 an easier place to smash taboos than say London at the, at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this, this idea that, that um, globalization is a 21st century phenomenon is, is so, is so mis- wrongheaded. Um, you know, the, the more you study history, the more you realize that we're actually quite provincial <laughs> compared to the way um, people inter- in, interacted across time and space in, in, in previous eras. Um, there was a, you know, a, a, a lot of communication and interaction between Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, who grew up in Cincinnati um, and, and you know, found their way to study in, in Edinburgh and Paris and London and, and created a, a kind of a global sorority and fraternity of people with progressive ideas. Um, you know, I think um, it, it's, it's startling at first to realize that what we think of as the interconnectedness of the world, um, the technology's come a long way, but that the interconnectedness has always been there. <laughs> Yeah, and I found that too. I mean, definitely there was a discussion about leprosy and how to deal with it all around the world at the turn of the century. Um, and doctors, they, they had international conferences to try and figure out what the cure was, what the, what the cause was. We still don't actually even know how it's transmitted from one person to another. Um, but what is uniquely American about this story is the way the patients 
rallied and started to fight for their rights. And there, I think that that was very much an American um, sentiment that we as individuals can take, take control and we can, you know, through, through what they had a, a crusading newspaper, they, they, they rallied allies from the outside of the hospital, the, the American Legion, even Hollywood to fight for their rights. And to me, that is a very um, um, uh, American story. And one that people in leprosy colonies all around the world, they were actually connected. They did communicate like Janice was saying, there was, you know, they, they were watching what was going on at Carville patients around the world. And, but it was happening at Carville. And that's where the cure was found as well. I think that's, that's a uniquely American attitude that, that what'll happen if I don't, you know, what, 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 what how, how can we, how can we change things um, instead of what am I supposed to do? Um, yeah. And, and in Carville, it was also, you know, it was after World War um, II that, you know, this country had just fought for freedom around the world and the patient's like, wait, what about us? You know, we're, we don't even have the right to vote. We're gonna fight for the, you know, our freedom as well. You know, it, it really, um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you, Pam, were there parts of the book that were hard to write where you're just cringing going, don't do this. And, uh, you know, we've got to correct people from doing things wrong. Oh, I don't think there was any part that was hard to write. I was I I I I loved writing every minute of it. I had I had an abundance of material to work with. And part of it was that the, a number of the patients had written memoirs. Um, they had this newspaper, this crusading newspaper that came out every month that was written by the patients. It depicted so much of their lives. Um, there was a, a patient called, named Stanley Stein who was editor of the newspaper who kept you know, very, um, um, uh, lots and lots of records. Um, and they're all now at an archive at a museum that's actually at Carville, um, still exists at Carville. Um, the Daughters of Charity were the nurses at Carville. They were the only people that they could recruit who would go and work at a leprosy hospital uh, back in 1896. And they continued to be the nurses at the hospital until 2005. Those are the nuns in Emmitsburg? Yeah, and so their their headquarters is one of their um, headquarters is in Emmitsburg, and those sisters kept meticulous records. They kept diaries, everything that happened day by day by day. Um, so I really had a kind of a gold mine of, of information. And as I said, I love telling all of these stories and finding all these incredible characters, and 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 their 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 fight for mm -hmm. um, for, for their freedom. And Janice, with your research, was there a good archive of information? With a lot of these schools going away, it seems like it, it'd be harder. Um, you know, I think what they say, if you're going to do biography, is that if you don't feel like you're drowning in material, then you probably don't have enough. Um, and, and that's true. The, the, the Blackwell archive is extravagantly huge. Um, there were nine Blackwell siblings. They were more of a tribe than, than your average family. They really depended and looked to each other and they all sort of drove each other nuts at the same time. So they were constantly leaving and writing to each other about each other. Um, so the, the, the sibling correspondence alone was hundreds of thousands of pieces. Um, not hundreds of thousands, okay. There were probably <laughs> hundreds of thousands of pieces in total, um, but there was, there was more than 100,000 pieces of material at the Schlesinger Library at, at, at Radcliffe. Um, there was another 30,000, I think, at the Library of Congress. Um, and that was just the two most obvious places to look. Um, you know, uh, once you have a, a notable family member like Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor, or like Lucy Stone and, and, and Antoinette Brown, who were also prominent, those archives are, are preserved. People keep those letters. Um, so there weren't too much of the terrible holes in the record that make a biographer so you know sort of sigh resignedly and 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 look for a different story to tell <laughs> there was enough okay that's good good to hear that's encouraging uh, i was going to ask a little bit about the role of barriers in your stories because there are obvious barriers with the blackwells um would there have been a story had they been apprenticed to become doctors and gone different routes without the barrier of the medical school admission? 
I, well, it's interesting. I, you know, as I said, Elizabeth Blackwell chose medicine not because she wanted to do medicine, but because it was a, a graphic way to make this point about a woman's ability. So the fact that medical school existed with its lectures and examinations and its diploma was the reason she went in that direction. Um, she, you know, it was a it was a barrier she could see that she could surmount that would allow her to demonstrate something to the world. So in a funny way, the barrier is the point. Um, uh, after she received that diploma, then she discovered a whole host of other barriers that were much more difficult to get over. Um, and, but I think that in many ways, the Elizabeth Blackwell story is about idealism. She was somebody who was driven by idealism and the idea that her behavior an example could improve the world. She wasn't much interested in healing human beings, but she was really interested in healing humanity. Um, Emily Blackwell was much more naturally drawn to natural science and became um, much more of a, of a doctor in the way we think of the word doctor in that she was interested in practice, in technique, in surgery. Um, and I think for her, the barriers were much more practical and pragmatic things like how do i raise enough money to keep this hospital going um not you know how do i change the world to the same extent as her sister so they're an interesting complementary pair and it also brings up why they created a separate school for women because they didn't have their own community and their own group to to, to move into um they didn't grow the number of women they um initially and part of the part of the, what was interesting was they're the first and third. There's nothing about the second and fourth women doctor. Well, right. The, the, Elizabeth and Emily were the first and third women to get mainstream medical degrees from men's medical colleges, and, and allopathic medical institutions, not homeopathic ones. Um, that always begs the question, who was the second? The second um, was a woman who had actually named um, Nancy Talbot Clark, who had gotten her degree from the same place that Emily had at Cleveland Medical College, which is now Case Western. Um, and it's interesting because it's one of those, those sort of salient moments in the story that I'm telling about female misogyny, um, which I find very recognizable and modern and, and, and disappointing. Um, the Blackwell sisters were very wary of Nancy Clark, even though she had achieved just what they had, um, having you know, struggled to get to the point where they got, they were very wary of being undermined by another woman who might be considered less serious about the goal. Nancy Clark was an attractive younger woman and they always referred to her as little Mrs. Clark, not Dr. Clark. Uh, and they, they kept their distance. And that was, again, a disappointing thing to learn. And it was also very relatable. Um, I, we, I think we all have met people who are not necessarily great collaborators because they are worried about protecting their own achievements. Um, that's very human. And it was also a business competitor as they were building their own hospital and medical school. Um, who right. else can do that? I, I'm not sure one other doctor could have would have knocked them off their 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 the place where they had climbed. Um, but it was a very very real moment in the story. Um, I guess one of the questions: How do these stories help our understanding of the standard of care? today and what are our barriers today that we're gonna be going through with, with female physicians or with other, other types of medical education? Are there other barriers you're looking at or you think need to be broken? Well, can I just, uh, 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 talking about in the case of Hansen's disease, um, you know, these patients uh, still come if they're diagnosed in the United States to a facility in Baton Rouge that is run by the US government. Uh, they come there initially to get sort of initial care and so they can figure out you know, how to respond or, or how to deal with the disease, but also how to still deal with the stigma because that's still very much uh, in, in many ways, you know, more of a threat to the, uh, the, the patients than um, the disease itself. Um, and, yeah, there are still barriers. I mean, um, they do did a survey of the patients who have come to this facility and about 50% of them said when they were diagnosed, they wanted to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is today. And it's because they're so worried about how society will receive them. Um, so I think it is partly, you know, that, that 
the message has to get out that this is not a dangerous disease. This is not, you know, a threat to people because people still today do not know that it is barely contagious, mildly contagious and easily cured. So I think that that is definitely one thing. And we still, we still have people using the threat of leprosy to, um, to, to demonize people. It has been used um, you know, in the fight about the caravans of immigrants coming from Central America. You know, some of the critics said, you know, they're bringing in all these terrible diseases like leprosy. Um, people who were criticizing some of the homeless uh, camps in Los Angeles were spreading um, rumors that the patients, I mean, that the, the, the homeless individuals were um, uh, spreading leprosy, which is stupid. I mean, it's just not true. So um, you're saying the lessons have been learned, but it hasn't been disseminated. Yeah, I think so. I think very much, you know. Uh, the patients made some uh, uh, prior, they certainly made progress on the, on the physical, uh, finding a physical cure, a medical cure, but the cure of the stigma, there's still a long way to go. So to wrap up, are there other points that we should bring up or discuss about the books before we sign off? Pam, any final thoughts? Oh, I guess, I, I guess the only thing I would say, I just love I love these stories. I mean, and Janice's story. I mean, that the, it's just so wonderful to see what people do, individual people, and, and how they fight against, um, you know, all the uh, all these barriers as we've been talking about. And I, I just feel like, you know, it gives one hope. In many ways, these are, you know, sad stories, um, or at least in my case. But you know. It's just wonderful to see what the what humans can do, and I just think I mean that's why I wrote this book, and 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 I hope people will read it for that. Yeah, recognizing the humanness of of stories that ended a hundred years before we were conceived. Um, you know, I, I think one of the best descriptions of biography that I've ever seen is that it's like a handshake across time. Um, you know, the idea that the things that we grapple with are things that have been grappled with in in all eras in different ways by different people and if you can if you can bring a story forward and reintroduce it and demonstrate to a reader that um, create a moment of recognition for a reader um, of a of a of an individual that they would never have encountered now um, I think that's a very precious thing that I'm grateful that I get to do it's it's a gift. And both of you have done a tremendous job at bringing your stories to life through the conversations, the descriptions, the history. I really appreciate the stories. I appreciate the time. And thank you very much. Thank you. This was great. Thanks for having us. That was really a fascinating presentation. And we have many more like it. We have an amazing lineup of author presentations taking place right here throughout the month of May. You won't want to miss them. So go to Gaithersburg Book festival.org and look over the schedule so you can plan the rest of your festival month. And now here's an important message from renowned author and independent bookstore owner, Ann Patchett and her dog, Sparky. Enjoy everyone and thank you for attending. I'm Ann Patchett here at Parnassus Books with my dog, Sparky. And I wanna tell you the importance of supporting your local independent bookstore, Politics and Prose. They are a remarkable partner with this book festival. Now, when a book festival is live, it's really easy. You just go to the table and you buy your book and then you go to the event. But when a book festival is virtual, it gets a little trickier because you're home and you might think, well, you know, I'll just buy the book on Amazon. So I'm here to tell you, don't buy the book on Amazon. For one thing, Jeff Bezos has enough money, right? He's trying to colonize the moon or something. He doesn't need anything that you've got. Politics and Prose, on the other hand, they're your local independent bookstore and you love them. And they bring you so many events. They work harder than any bookstore I know in their community. And if you want them to be there alive and healthy and well when all this is over, you actually need to support them. They are the people that are putting a tax base in your community, okay? So you have teachers and police officers and firefighters 
And when you pay a couple dollars more for a book, you're creating jobs in your community. So enjoy your book festival, support politics and prose. Remember, Ann Patchett and Sparky think it's the thing to do. Shop local. Thank you.